The career of Joseph Stalin, the Man of Steel, is a succession of waves of terror. First, following the death of communist leader Lenin, Stalin rose to power by plotting against and eventually eliminating his political rivals. Second, his ruthlessly imposed policy of collective farms starved 10 million to death in the early 1930s. Third, his purges later that decade killed and exiled millions more and tightened his grip on power. Fourth, in World War II he defeated Hitler at the cost of 26 million Soviet lives, but afterwards executed many Russian heroes. And in 1953, Stalin was preparing a final wave of terror when suddenly he died. So these doors are like, are like a yeah. bunker. Yeah. It's like a bunker with very heavy doors. Yeah. yeah. And these could withstand the nuclear war, I guess. Yeah. Simon has well, persuaded the director of the archive, so which contains can... most of the secret files of the former the, communist regime, uh, to take him down into its vaults. Right. So, like these. So, so this, this is where this the documents actually... Yeah. Yeah. This is where they actually yeah. are. Inside them is a medical report on the death of Stalin, which has only just been released after being locked away for 50 years. Inside our yeah. most precious and valuable documents, Compiled by the doctors who watched Stalin slowly die, was this incredibly detailed file suppressed because it contains information on Stalin's illness that those surrounding him needed to keep secret? This file has just been released and it contains very exciting new materials. Until now we never knew the minute by minute uh, progress of Stalin's death. This great mysterious event in 1953. On one hand, it's an intimate, personal document about an old man dying. And it happens that this old man is the most powerful man in the world, at his most powerless. It's telling you, minute by minute, how he breathed, what his temperature was, or how he urinated. But at the same time, it's showing how new political leaders may have concealed and suppressed medical details in order to conceal their own potential mischief. And that's very exciting. Simon will be using this document to help disentangle some of the inconsistencies which surround Stalin's last hours. The picture of Stalin's last 48 hours that emerges is full of suspicious questions. Why did the ultra-paranoid leader leave himself vulnerable in his sleep by telling his bodyguards to go to bed? Why did his most senior ministers deprive Stalin of medical assistance for 12 hours? And why did the official announcement of his death omit crucial medical details? If the death of Stalin was a murder, one could treat it like any Agatha Christie who done it. We would look at first of all at motive and then at opportunity. But first we'd ask the big question, who really wanted him dead? The first suspect is, surprisingly, Stalin's daughter Svetlana. And an examination of her motives must begin with a crushing tragedy. On November the 8th, 1932, when Stalin's wife could no longer tolerate life married to her bullying husband, 
she denounced him in a final letter as a tyrant. Then, she shot herself dead in the heart. Inevitably, the life of her daughter Svetlana was scarred by this event. Today, she lives as a recluse and no longer gives interviews. In our family, there was always this shadow of my mother's suicide, which was done not for nothing, and uh, everybody felt it and knew that. So that was the moment which uh, gave me the first shock and first yes. uh, thought that not everything is, is right. Are you convinced that your father was to blame for your mother's suicide? Well, this is what every, everybody's opinion in the family was. In order to understand more about Stalin's relationship with his daughter, Simon is going to her mother's grave to meet Svetlana's cousin, Kira, who was present at her aunt's funeral. He saw her there in the coffin and said that she died like an enemy, and he pushed the coffin away from him. My mother said, perhaps you are to blame. No, he said, she died like an enemy. Perhaps that's why he took revenge on us afterwards and broke our lives. After the funeral, Stalin arrested his dead wife's relations one by one. Finally, he turned on Kira. In the end, I was in a camp for half a year, and then I was in exile for five years. It wasn't much fun, but I think this is how he took revenge on us in the end. Stalin's behavior left his daughter ever more isolated. Svetlana was completely terrified. She went to him and said, Papa, why have you put my aunts in jail? He said, if you start defending them, I'll put you in jail too. That's the kind of loving father he was. And Svetlana's isolation became complete when adulthood arrived. In 1943, Stalin discovered his little girl had embarked on her first affair. He broke into her room, abusing and ridiculing her. Then he arranged for Svetlana's lover, to be arrested. The lover was duly made to confess to invented crimes and sent to the salt mines in Siberia. The tragic story of our family only confirms that he was a really a moral and spiritual monster. After all Stalin had done to Svetlana, you might have thought she would welcome his death. But I don't believe that's the case. Basically, I think she still loved him. The links between his little girl and the great dictator were long and enduring. He was all she had. In the end, he may have been a cruel dictator, but he was still her father. If Svetlana didn't kill him, then who did? Of the two siblings, Vasily Stalin had arguably even greater cause to loathe his father. Mm -hmm. 
Vasily, the older child, was even more damaged by his mother's death than his sister. Her suicide removed the one protective barrier between him and his contemptuous father. Simon is meeting a boyhood friend of Stalin's children, Stepan Mikoyan. Stepan is the son of one of Stalin's closest political allies. He grew up in the hothouse world of the ruling communist elite. Svetlana told me that whenever he came to see his father, he was so afraid of him, he could not even utter two words properly. He felt frozen and didn't know what to say to Stalin. Being Stalin's son catapulted Vasily up the ranks of the Air Force. He was soon made general. But being promoted beyond his abilities, Vasily was, by the mid-1940s, a glaringly visible embarrassment to his father. He constantly tried to seduce other men's wives, culminating in an act of aggressive seduction that Stalin could not ignore. Once at one of these parties, he seduced the wife of a famous film director, Carmen, who he'd known for a long time. He locked her in his country villa and left her there. His wife was away somewhere, so he held Nina Carmen, who was considered one of the most beautiful women alive, for a week there. Vasily's fall from grace was inevitable. Stalin sent him to the front, then demoted him from his exalted military position and added to his public humiliation by locking him up, revealing to the world Vasily's utter dependence on his father. The pattern of Vasily's life had been set. Overpromotion and then humiliation, debauchery and failed marriages, alcoholism and futile attempts to dry out. As he watched his father die, you might have expected Vasily to want him dead, to blame the mess of his life on his father. But I don't think this is the case. He was dependent on Stalin. More than anyone, he depended for his status, his life itself, on Stalin's survival. He didn't want his father dead. However, there was another person near Stalin's deathbed who had the right background for murder. Vyacheslav Molotov, a man with blood-stained hands. Since 1912, Stalin and Molotov had been friends and comrades in both work and play. They holidayed together, but had also drawn up the death lists of thousands of people together. Molotov added the names of victims' wives and children to ensure that whole families were wiped out. Molotov was cold, ruthless, efficient, ambitious. In his office, he could say, I'm going to sleep for 13 minutes and wake up on the 13th. It was not for nothing. The public expected him to succeed Stalin. Stalin had other ideas. By the end of his life, Stalin became increasingly obsessed with the idea that there was a Jewish conspiracy against him. And his suspicious glance turned on Molotov's Jewish wife, Polina. In 1949, she was arrested on trumped-up charges, 
including having group sex with young communists. And Molotov was forced to divorce her. How was it that someone who had been so close to Stalin for so very long, who had proved his loyalty to Stalin again and again with his tireless labor, could tolerate the sudden persecution of his beloved wife? To answer these questions, Simon went to meet Molotov's grandson. Of course, he protested against uh, what Stalin did, and all the rumors that he said nothing to Stalin, that's just not true. Uh, but uh, there was not much he could do, because Stalin's answer was, you know, the special services provided me with information, uh, and uh, that's not in my power to change a thing, uh, which of course was also not true, and my, my grandfather knew it well. In late 1952, Stalin turned on Molotov himself, denouncing him in a speech as a potential traitor who had made mistakes for the last 20 years. My grandfather knew the rules of the game better than anyone else, and he had a clear feeling that he's in trouble physically, and not just politically. Uh, th there was no way uh, in Stalinist Russia to suffer politically and not to suffer physically that was uh, absolutely interrelated. Molotov's complete fall from grace became clear 10 weeks before Stalin's death. While his wife was being transported into the heart of Russia, Molotov made a last desperate attempt to re-establish relations with Stalin. Uninvited, he turned up at Stalin's 73rd birthday party. But Molotov was powerless to save his wife Polina from entering the vast system of camps that he himself had helped to build. When Stalin even refused to acknowledge his presence, he knew that his own days were numbered. It was now clear he would never see his wife again while Stalin lived. Only Stalin's death could bring him back from the abyss. So, did Molotov murder Stalin? Molotov had every reason to want Stalin dead. He should have wanted Stalin dead. But I don't believe that he did kill him. And first of all, Stalin was the high priest and supreme leader of this international religion of communism. And Molotov was its most devout believer. So I don't think he'd have gone against it. But second, in his last weeks, Stalin didn't see Molotov. And Molotov had no access. So whatever his motive... He certainly didn't have the opportunity. So the next suspect, who did have access to Stalin at his last supper, was Nikita Khrushchev, the man to whom Stalin's death ultimately gave power over the Soviet Union. When Stalin says dance, a wise man dances. So said Khrushchev, and that is just what Stalin forced him to do every night. An illiterate peasant, Khrushchev rose in the 1930s to become governor of Moscow. By day, he murdered enemies of the people. By night, entertained his boss at increasingly humiliating evenings. Khrushchev said later that Stalin made him feel like a ludicrous, lumbering old cow.
Simon is going to meet his next witness, Khrushchev's son, Sergei, whose father told him stories about the bizarre life of Stalin's inner circle. Stalin dinners started very late, and many times it started with the watching movies, watching the old American Western without any translation, so they didn't understand what they're really talking. Why, that's singing Sandy. Who? The most notorious gunman since Billy the Kid. Stalin could watch 20 times, 40 times. You have to watch with him. He's singing Sandy, I tell you. And after this, at one o'clock in the morning, you have to go to Stalin Dacha, sitting with him and eating. And Stalin was very suspicious, so he tried to make these people drunk, maybe they will say something else. Because he have different tests. He talk about that he's old, that he now cannot, cannot run the country, and he will resign. And then he are looking what you will respond. Would you respond that, yes, you are 70, you're old, then it will be your last words. It is part of this usual game that he playing with his colleagues all his life. Typically, towards the end of his life, Stalin's parties would end with these threatening words. You've all got old. I'll replace you all. My father told that we are temporary people. He understood that sooner or later Stalin would replace them and that also that they living just depending on the Stalin's will. At the end of one evening, one guest of Stalin's spoke these words to Khrushchev. One never knows if one is going home or to prison. I think would the Stalin live two, three years longer, it will be nobody there. I will not be here. My father will be purged. And many of the other, to the level of the ministers and the lower level, will be replaced by the new people. And he started this preparation. So my father and all of us were very lucky that he died just in time. So could Khrushchev have killed him? Here's someone you would expect to want Stalin dead, because after all, here was the man who succeeded to the Soviet throne. And yet, I don't believe that he killed Stalin. Apart from anything else, there was no guarantee he would succeed to Stalin's throne at all. And indeed, there was someone close to Stalin, hungrier for the job, and just as well positioned to seize it. And that was the real suspect in this case, Lavrenti Beria. Stalin first recognized his protégé's potential on holiday in 1933, when Beria, required to help out with the gardening, told Stalin that there is no tree I will not chop down. He then murdered his way through the ranks of the secret police. After engineering his boss's downfall in 1938, he made it to the very top. In 1949, he delighted Stalin by masterminding the development of the Soviet Union's own atomic bomb. Yeah. Stalin knew that Beria was the most ruthless, the most calculating, the most sadistic. 
and probably the most gifted of all his cohorts. As secret police chief, he had killed and maimed and tortured everyone Stalin wanted to be killed and tortured, including Stalin's own family. But he was also a superb manager, a brilliant statesman, a man who'd kept Russia going during the war. He was really very much the most talented of all around Stalin. And yet he was also the most genuine monster. He was a pervert. He drove round Moscow in his black limousine, picking women off the streets, kidnapping them, raping them and often murdering them. And lately, bones have been found in the cellars of his Moscow house. But unlike Molotov and Khrushchev, Beria's perception of Stalin was not tempered by true faith in communism. As the 50s approached, and seeing that it had failed, he also saw the tyrant beneath Stalin's godlike image. He began to loathe Stalin. Sensing this, Stalin became suspicious of his fellow Georgian. He began to believe that Beria was plotting against him. In his memoirs, Khrushchev recounted one striking instance of Stalin's growing suspicion of Beria. All of a sudden he said, Why am I surrounded by Georgians? Beria replied, But these people are all devoted to you. Does that mean Russians aren't devoted to me? I didn't mean that at all. I just meant that they're loyal servants. Stalin said, I don't need their loyalty. Clear them out! Beria shuffled out of the room like a man who had been beaten up. My father thought Beria knew everything about Stalin was one person who was close to Stalin de Gaulle. <laughs> My father and Molotov knew the surface, but Beria received all the orders from the Stalin how to kill these people, how to execute them, that made them, him very dangerous to Stalin. So Stalin started plotting against Beria and in the first few weeks of 1953, Stalin decided that he would eliminate Beria by implicating him in his last great conspiracy, the Jewish doctor's plot. This, Stalin's last wave of terror, had been planned down to the smallest detail. He had camps built in a distant province. He accused Jewish doctors of plotting to murder Soviet leaders. Empty trucks rolled into the cities. Prominent Jewish families began disappearing in the early hours. Then, on January the 13th, 1953, an article appeared in the government newspaper Pravda implying that Beria had neglected his duty to catch the alleged criminals. Beria knew where this was leading. He could soon be denounced as a fellow conspirator against Stalin. It was at this point, according to one theory, that Beria began a secret campaign to change staff surrounding Stalin. Simon is going to meet someone directly affected by this, the daughter of Stalin's personal bodyguard for over 20 years. She believes her father's sacking was masterminded by Beria to isolate Stalin. Beria knew that while the person who was most devoted to Stalin was with him, he was never going to succeed in his dirty plans. It was then that Beria made up his mind to destroy my father by any means. But as he was very clever and scheming, he approached him gradually. 
In November of 1952, my father was called in for interrogations. And once, when he returned from one of these, he said to my mother and me, it's likely that I'll be arrested, but if I'm no longer going to be by Stalin's side, he will soon be dead too. This is what he said, and this is what really happened. Two and a half months after my father was arrested, Stalin passed away. February the 28th, 1953, Stalin's Last Supper. And the archive shows it was business as usual, the boss humiliating his drunken guests. However, after the guests had left, the night ended oddly. At 6 a.m., a new bodyguard called Krustalyov emerged from Stalin's room. Strangely, he told the other guards that Stalin had issued an order for them to go to bed. One of the other bodyguards later said this had never happened before and that no one but Krustalyov had heard the order. Molotov's grandson believes that Krustalyov may have been acting on Beria's instructions. The guards around uh, Stalin were not reporting directly to Beria, but many of those people, like Krustalyov, for example, they were f former subordinates of Beria quite close to him. My grandfather did not exclude uh, that Stalin was assassinated and, of course, mentioned the name of Beria, uh, who was uh, a clear person who was interested uh, in killing Stalin and who uh, had uh, some people to do that. So could the new bodyguard, Krustalyov, have been one of Beria's people? Could Krustalyov have poisoned Stalin as he slept? The events of the next few hours only add to the suspicions. Twelve hours went by and the boss, a well-known insomniac, did not appear. Until at 6.30 the next evening, his staff finally saw his light go on. But then three more hours passed, and still Stalin failed to emerge. Imagine in this tiny, enclosed, high-security zone, rising anguish, fear and nervousness. No movement from Stalin. We last saw him turning on the light at 6 p.m. Nothing. Of hours afterwards, no movement. Um, the guards become increasingly worried what to do. And later on in the evening, they finally had an excuse to go and see what had happened to Stalin because um, the post arrives from the Central Committee. And this means that they have an excuse to go into his apartment. The archive records that it was not until 10 p.m. that a bodyguard finally went in. He found Stalin lying on the floor in a pool of his own urine. The guards called Beria, who ordered, don't tell anybody about Comrade Stalin's illness and don't call back. This night is pregnant with rumor. There's a sort of miasma of, of, um, of crisis through which it's very hard to shine a clear light. But what we do know is that at about three in the morning, Beria had taken the leadership role and crept into the house to find out what was happening and to look at Comrade Stalin. The bodyguard who had discovered Stalin remembered Beria entering the room with his chubby sidekick, Malenkov. What's wrong with the boss? What do you mean by it starting a panic? The boss is obviously sleeping peacefully. Let's go, Malenkov. Now a remarkable event took place. Someone, it is not known who, 
issued an order halting preparations for the Jewish doctor's plot. Could this order have come from Beria, trying to save himself from the new wave of terror? Meanwhile, Stalin slept on, and still no doctors were called. Stalin's actually been in this comatose state for about 12 hours, still soaked in his own urine, um, still snoring on the sofa. No doctors have been called, and in fact nothing has been done. And the answer could be that the doctors were deliberately not called for 12 hours in order to give Stalin time to die. My father said that it was all a plot by members of the government, headed by Beria, not to give Stalin medical help. That's what my father thought. The guards call again at dawn, and they say to Beria, help, he is ill, there's something really wrong here, you've got to do something, call the doctors. And Beria and Malenkov, who were in charge, then call the doctors. And the doctors then arrive. Now, of course, they're new doctors. All, the, all his traditional doctors, all his usual doctors, all the best specialists in the Soviet Union are, of course, Jewish and are therefore um, imprisoned in the doctor's plot and being tortured at that very moment, probably. Therefore, this new set of doctors turn up very nervously, and suddenly everyone arrives at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Beria shouted at the inexperienced doctors while Vasily cursed them. One of them turned to Beria saying, The clotted blood vessel, it's the size of a five kopeck piece. Comrade Stalin would still be alive if the vessel had been cleared in time. Beria replied, Are you going to save his life or not? Beria's subsequent conduct only strengthened the case against him. No sooner had Stalin fallen ill than Beria started going around spewing hatred against him and mocking him. But interestingly enough, as soon as Stalin showed signs of consciousness on his face and made us think he might recover, Beria threw himself on his knees, seized Stalin's hand and started kissing it. However, when Stalin lost consciousness again, Beria showed his true colors. The archive now further raises the prospect of murder undermining the idea that Stalin's illness was solely caused, as officially related, by a hemorrhage in the brain. 5th of March, it's now midday in the dacha. Around the bed, everyone's watching, just quiet. <coughs> and suddenly, Stalin retches and then vomits blood. And this is terribly significant. We knew nothing of this before. Why was his stomach suddenly bleeding so heavily? And the answer could well be that he had received some sort of poison which caused his stomach to bleed. But in any case, this bleeding from the stomach, this vomiting um, of blood, is, is surely significant. So could this be the result of poison administered earlier by the bodyguard on Beria's orders? My grandfather thought Beria had a special laboratories working for him, which was specialized on poisons and... Uh, other means of uh, killing people. So uh, for Beria, it was not a big deal uh, to organize an assassination. The idea that the vomiting of blood was caused by poison gains greater weight when Simon looks at the version in the Soviet press. We're looking here at Pravda on the, uh, the 6th of March, the announcement of Stalin's death the next day, the next morning, and one finds no mention whatsoever of stomach hemorrhaging. No blood in the stomach, no vomiting of blood. So what has happened between the public announcement of Stalin's death and the conclusion of the doctors just hours earlier? Well, someone has decided, and clearly it's Beriam, to drop 
this rather significant information about the hemorrhaging of blood into Stalin's stomach. Why? And that's the great mystery of this document. Were they trying to cover up the fact that Beria had poisoned Stalin? At 9.50 p.m. March the 5th, Stalin was finally dying. Svetlana described his last act. Suddenly he lifted his hand as though he were pointing up above and bringing down a curse on us all. The gesture was full of menace. Vasily shouted, The bastards have murdered father. Then came Beria's voice, the ink of triumph unconcealed. Krustalev! Krustalev! My car! Krustalov, he shouts to the bodyguard. Yes, the very same bodyguard who, um, who, had, who had passed on the order that Stalin be left alone earlier. And they bring round the car, and Beria rushes off to seize power. But Beria never did make it to the top. Khrushchev outwitted him, and in a few months, the secret policeman found himself naked in a cell, weeping for mercy with a gun against his skull. No one knows where Beria's remains were finally stowed, but can we now finally decide if he's guilty as charged? Did Beria really kill Joseph Stalin? I mean, we know he had the motive, we know he had the opportunity. He certainly had the murderous expertise and the knowledge of poisons. And actually, there was another compelling bit of evidence. At Stalin's funeral, he whispered to Molotov, and he said, I did you all a favor, I did him in. So, we know that Beria wanted people to think that he'd killed Stalin, but the big question is, did he? Simon asked his witnesses who, if any of our suspects, killed Stalin. From the inner circle, Beria could do it because he was an immoral person. Beria. Beria, possibly. Beria. Although these witnesses suspect Beria, Simon is not convinced. I simply don't believe there's enough evidence to convict Beria in a court of law. Let's reassess the evidence. The dismissal of trusted staff around Stalin was perhaps just one more sign of his ever-increasing paranoia. It was also typical of Stalin's paranoia and unpredictability to prefer locking himself up at night rather than trusting his guards. The delay in getting medical assistance was probably a response to Stalin's recent persecution of the doctors. The stomach hemorrhage and the vomiting of blood could just be the result of a sick old body packing up, partly because he mistrusted medical advice. And the leadership may have deleted these details from the public announcement because Stalin's system of government meant they were understandably frightened of arousing any suspicion. Every suspicious circumstance was the result of the terror that Stalin himself inspired. Alone and dying, it may be that people were simply too afraid to come to his aid. So, if I had to point the finger at someone at Stalin's deathbed scene to take responsibility for Stalin's death. Then, I think, ironically, I'd point the finger at Stalin himself. Let's go.